they tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? What kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, uh, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> wow, let me think. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, I'm still doing it. Did you know it's possible for the question to already have a built-in assumption? Look at that question. Do you think humans are still evolving? What's the built-in assumption? That humans evolved. Now, how's a Christian kid supposed to answer that for homework for Monday? Hmm? Well, they could answer honestly, like many scientifically competent Christians would, and say that yes, we're still evolving. If they say no, we're not still evolving, then they either weren't paying attention to or didn't adequately understand the lessons so far. You see, being Christian doesn't necessarily mean that you're a willfully ignorant, science-denying religious extremist trying to reject reality. Plenty of Christians understand and accept evolution because there are way too many ways to trace and or demonstrate that to still pretend that it isn't real or doesn't happen. I would say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. The question is not poorly written, but the preacher's answer to it is, because it contradicts what he already said before. I, as the teacher, would take the preacher back through the lesson plan and remind him that he's already said that he accepts microevolution and even the origin of species by natural selection. He even admitted that speciation has been observed multiple times. So he already accepts that evolution happened, both micro and macro, though he doesn't know what either of those words mean. He already accepts that every subspecies of every species in every genus evolved from a common ancestor in every family, and maybe well beyond that, too, with each ancestral group continually dividing into daughter groups and further subdivided subsets. The preacher doesn't yet know how far it goes, but he already admitted that at least that much of it is known. So we should be well past the point of trying to pretend that evolution never happened at all, since he already admitted that even he knows that it did. It's like asking the question, you know, why are elephants orange? Boy, no, there's a tough one. Why are they orange anyway? Uh, they're not orange? Mm-hmm. This is not learning to think critically. This is a Soviet-style indoctrination-type brainwashing question. And when the kid gets done taking this class, he's going to think he knows how to think. But he doesn't. He knows how to be told what to believe, and he never understands how it happened to him. That's not thinking critically. Such projection. This preacher just described his own position, indoctrination, where he makes unsupported assertions backed by no evidence at all on his own assumption of authority, when really he's completely ignorant, unqualified, and unable to deny the work of biologists that use evolution every day in their research. For example, evolution is foundational to understanding how pathogens mutate and evolve, but creationism adds no knowledge or understanding whatsoever to curing diseases, despite the should-be illegal claims of fraudulent faith healers. Yet the preacher's congregation is just supposed to believe whatever he says simply because he said so. That's indoctrination, not thinking critically. That's why the preacher thinks he knows how to think critically, but then he does a seminar like this proving that he doesn't. If we're going to think critically, Let's first understand what that means. Every year of the last four decades, the Foundation for Critical Thinking holds an international conference wherein they defined critical thinking as the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reason, or communication as a guide to belief and action. That means the teachers should provide arguments and evidence of current or historic scientists, and the students should be able to stand on the shoulders of giants to analyze the data themselves and draw their own conclusions as to what is indicated. But religious extremist science denialists don't want any part of that because they're afraid that would challenge the students' fixed beliefs and undermine parental authority. That's what the issue really is. Creationists want their kids to keep believing. They don't want their kids to know any better. They're afraid their kids will learn forbidden knowledge, and that would dispel their delusion, which is even more precious to believers than even their own children. Then they tell the kids, we've got evidence for evolution from homologous structures. Wow, what's that mean? Yes, boys and girls, did you know you have two bones in your wrist and they're called the radius and the ulna? Pretty cool. And did you know the alligator has two bones in his forelimb? And look at this, they're called radius and ulna. See that? That proves we are related. That's what they're going to tell them. 
except that they're not going to say that at all. Science uses critical thinking, so we don't tell the kids what to believe. Instead, we show them the facts and evidence leading to the current consensus, and we call it evidence rather than proof because science isn't about proving things. Homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. See what I mean? They're talking about evidence, not proof, from reason rather than authority. Here are the facts of the matter that led these other scientists to believe this. What do you make of it? We don't tell the kids what to believe. <laughs> Science is not a belief system. It's an investigation that is ongoing, and the students should be prepared to take part in that investigation. They don't have to believe it, but they should at least understand it, because if there are any significant flaws in this or any theory, then how are you going to identify and correct those flaws if you don't even know what the theory is? If you're so confused that you think that the theory of evolution includes the origin of life, the universe, and everything, then you don't even know what we're talking about. If you're so deluded that you think evolution teaches that we came from a rock, then you are literally clueless and would never even be able to identify an actual problem with the theory, much less correct it. It's found in just about every textbook. You got it in these other ones up here, I'm sure, don't you, Steve? Homologous structures as evidence for evolution. So it turns out that the textbooks don't say that it proves evolution like this preacher falsely alleged. It only says that this is one of the facts and evidence. So the preacher, I guess, is upset about the fact that there is a fact and evidence for evolution and that we're teaching these facts that he doesn't want the kids to know about. It's not just that the preacher wants the kids to reject the conclusion. He wants them to reject the evidence, too. And that's why he tells the kids that all these verifiable facts are just lies. He's also upset that the reason they can teach evolution is because there are facts to teach, things we can objectively determine to be true about a process we can actually understand and manipulate, both in the lab and in the field, with a theory that works, not just theoretically, but productively, that makes and fulfills predictions so that we can actually know things about evolution. It's not just a belief like creationism is. There is nothing you can teach about creation because there is absolutely nothing that anyone actually knows about it including whether it happened at all, much less which God was involved or what religious dogma was closest to correct, if there is any truth to any religion at all. For example, Darwin predicted from the theory of evolution that scientists would one day discover units of heritable information that allowed species to pass on their traits. And Darwin's contemporary, Gregor Mendel, solved the puzzle with genetics. But what useful predictions can be founded on creationism? What scientist has ever e extrapolated anything of use and research directly on creationism's founding principles. What could any scientist know and be able to use from viewing the world as having only started 10,000 years ago by the biblical God? All evidence points to a much more gradual, much older process. In fact, the biblical story of the descent of, of every species today from a boatload of animals would require a turbocharged, hyper-caffeinated, electro-mega-evolution within one millennium. And that's if you ignore everything in the fossil record. None of it makes any sense as an explanation of biodiversity as we see it today. But the theory of evolution continues to prove its ability to not just explain, but to make useful predictions, all without ever invoking inexplicable supernatural powers to explain anything. So we're not just looking at two competing hypotheses here. We are contrasting fact versus fantasy. They descended from a common ancestor, textbook says. Think critically. The bones are the same, boys and girls. See, that proves we're related. Evolved from a forelimb of a common ancestor. All right, let's think critically. Why is it that all vertebrates follow this same structure, when a god could have made any modifications necessary to improve the design or completely redesign any lineage? Why does everything follow this same pattern that evolution is restricted to, but that a designer couldn't be held to? Even when massive changes or complete restructuring would have been better, and an intelligent designer could have, should have, and would have done them. Why is it that all tetrapods are based on a pentadactyl hand, where artiodactyls lost one digit, and perissodactyls lost two, and horses whittled theirs all the way down to one? And we see these changes documented in the fossil record. Why is it that marine tetrapods like cetaceans, sirenians, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, sea turtles, and seals all have fingers and hands inside their flippers? Evolution had to make flippers out of hands, but God could have made flippers that didn't have hands in them. Evolution is not an intelligently designed process, which is why sirenians still have fingernails in their flippers. 
Every fictional animal men have ever imagined for any myth or movie always violates taxonomy. Every single one of them. We've never made one that fits. That's the difference between evolving species and created kinds. So why have we never seen even one exception, one living thing that doesn't fit into an evolutionary phylogeny? For example, when vertebrates learned to fly, God could have given bats wings to lizards or birds wings to mammals like so many of our myths illustrate, but bats wings are made of the same arm, hands, and finger bones as the other basal mammals in their clade. Pterosaur wings are modeled on the same bones as archosaur hands. The bird's wings are modeled on dinosaur hands, with the fingers now fused together where they didn't used to be. So they weren't designed that way. They evolved. Because all of these hand and arm configurations match the patterns established by their evolutionary phylogeny. Whereas a god could have made them with much more efficient bones or structures or other features that, that are better designed or suited to that task. Why are they all tetrapods? And God could have given them six limbs like insects have, or he could have changed anything he wanted to, however he wanted to, yet we never see any fundamental revision of anything, anywhere, ever. All we ever see are the minor modifications of past forms that precisely match evolution exclusively, and we see that consistently throughout modern biology and the fossil record as well, because contrary to what this preacher contends, we know that the geologic column really does exist and that stratigraphic layers have been reliably dated to a range of ages radiometrically. And we can see that the earliest forms in every lineage all trace back to a very primitive original form of something like a salamander. Then, after the appearance of actual reptiles and mammals, some of them went back to the sea, and we see transitions played out in a sequence where the earliest forms started out like regular land animals, and the most recent forms developed fluked tails like whales. And this, of course, includes whales as well as sirenians. So just looking at homology alone, taking fossil forms into account, we still have multiple lines of evidence from different fields of study converging to imply evolution exclusively, unanimously, and that's still just a portion of the evidence, just from homology alone, with not one actual fact from anywhere to contradict that or to imply anything else instead. This textbook says, <clears throat> Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. No, that is a factually accurate statement. Every part of it is correct. Remember that evidence is a body of facts, objectively verifiable data, that are positively indicative of and or exclusively concordant with one available position or hypothesis over any other. The taxonomic commonality that I just described perfectly matches an evolutionary phylogeny. And that, along with the fact that we can actually watch evolution happening, makes common ancestry extremely probable. And this consistency also directly contradicts the notion of separate miracles of special and original creation, especially since the base of these allegedly created kinds are undefined and indeterminable. So all of these collective facts, along with the several others that we have yet to discuss, really do indicate evolution from common ancestry rather than what the preacher is doing, which is just telling the kids what to believe without giving any reason whatsoever as to why they should believe that. They probably have a common designer. Mm -hmm. You can't just declare that something is probable just because you wish it was or want it to be. In order to show whether something is even possible, there must be some precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such possibility exists. So let's compare the support of two, let's be inappropriately charitable and call them both hypotheses. Is evolution possible? Well, just looking at homology and its consistency throughout every taxonomic clade, in addition to what we already know about evolutionary mechanisms, yeah, it's definitely more than possible. It's demonstrable, traceable, verifiable, certainly probable, such that even if creationism was true, creationists are forced to admit that at least some level of evolution has to be true too. And they usually admit even to macroevolution without knowing what it is or realizing that they weren't supposed to confess to that one as well. So what about this alleged creator? Well, there is no precedent, no parallel, no verified phenomenon to indicate that any god or anything supposedly supernatural is even possible. I'm not saying it's impossible. Well, it is physically impossible, though, though maybe not metaphysically impossible. But we can't say that there is a possibility when there is no possibility to show that anything supernatural even can exist or ever happened. 
And without that, the preacher cannot move on to the next step of showing probability, despite what he's already asserted for absolutely no reason at all. Most Christians around the world, and even in the United States, accept that evolution happens, and they believe that their God has a hand in guiding that somehow, or at least in getting it started. But we're not talking about some deistic sort of cosmic creator right now. We're talking about one who miraculously conjured different kinds of mammals and reptiles and so on, such that not all vertebrate tetrapods are biologically related to each other. Even creationists know that many, if not most, species really are related, having descended through evolutionary mechanisms. But they believe that some species were magically created unrelated to anything else. So where is the evidence of that? That's it, is it? That's really all the evidence you have. Okay. So the preacher made a demonstrably false statement. There is no possibility and thus not even a potential probability of his sort of divine designer. All probability is with evolution from common ancestry and there are no other options. You know, the different bones in different animals come from different genes on the chromosomes. They're not homologous to begin with, okay? <laughs> I don't know what this preacher misread, misunderstood, or thought he was talking about here, but I happen to know a professor of developmental biology, so I asked him about this comment, and of course the preacher is, at best, hopelessly confused, as he apparently always has been. And even if they were, that still wouldn't prove common ancestor. Once again, science isn't about proving things one way or another, because we don't want to unnecessarily limit our perspectives when there are so few absolutes and not that many dichotomies either. Instead, we weigh the facts to see whatever is indicated. So we have all of these lines of objective evidence for evolution. But if you try to argue for the oxymoronic concept of creation science instead, you'll find that all you have, all there is or ever was, are the highly dubious, questionable, and often obviously false claims of intracontradictory fables and folklore with nothing else outside of that to support those claims, but quite a lot to contradict each of them proves a common designer. No, it doesn't. It does not in any way imply nor even permit a common designer. A scientist would say that proof is reserved for mathematics, but if we were speaking in the context of lawyers, as this preacher often does, then proof would be an overwhelming preponderance of evidence beyond reasonable doubt. But all we have for creationism is reasonable doubt. Creationists don't have any evidence whatsoever there is not even the slightest indication that there is even a possibility to consider. Their sacred fables don't even count as hearsay, and all they cite beyond that are the logically fallacious arguments of question-begging ignorance and incredulity. Yet, this preacher wants to pretend, and is actually saying, that having every fact perfectly aligned with evolution and contradicting creationism somehow proves intelligent design? Obviously not. The same designer made them all. Did you know the lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy? You can go out in the parking lot and try it. They will. Well, they were both made by General Motors, so yeah. But why does every animal lineage adhere to their own clade as contrasted with the other clades they compete with, feed on, or flee from, as if there were a bunch of competing teams of designers? That proves they both evolved from Honda 14 million years ago. This preacher's willful ignorance also demonstrates his fear of understanding. He is actively trying to misunderstand science in order to preserve a preferred delusion, and he is trying to convey his confusion such that his audience will be just as befuddled as he is. I don't understand evolution, and I have to protect my kids from understanding it. We will not give in to the thinkers! <laughs> no. It's true many animals have a similar forelimb structure. That's a good observation. I agree. They say they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, bad conclusion. The irony is palpable, isn't it? In 1911, an American Civil War veteran wrote a number of satirical definitions into what he called the Devil's Dictionary. In that, he defined faith as belief without evidence in what is told by one who speaks without knowledge about things without parallel. That is what the preacher is demonstrating here. Though, to be fair, that's what all preachers demonstrate, to be honest. Then they'll say, this helps prove we all came from a rock. Well, now you really have got a bad conclusion there. Well, since no textbook or professor ever taught that, and no scientist ever believed that, then that is not the conclusion. And the preacher 
has a bad premise as well as a bad conclusion.